Bonjour. Hello, everyone. Welcome to all of you for this uh, conference devoted to the development of metropolises. Thank you for being with us. In the US, we talked about a post-COVID uh, season. We said that uh, cities will be emptied because of uh, working from home procedures. 81% of French people consider that the ideal uh, life is living at the countryside. But it's a reverse trend. Metropolises are gaining ground in France and in other countries, something that we'll be able to witness with our guests. But uh, there are lots of questions and issues, environmental uh, questions. It's a key point when you consider that uh, soils are increasingly artificial, uh, there is a water shortage, and according to the latest report of the IPCC, there will be a catastrophe in the offing. Social uh, issues have to be considered. How can we embed all the uh, layers of society? There are issues having to do with territoriality. How can we make sure that metropolises are not surrounded by deserts? So there are political questions and economic questions. So we have Meka Brunel. You are the head of Jessina Marlene Dolvec, head of SNCF Stations and Connections. Xavier Piechasek, you are the president of the board of RTE. And Laurent Germain, the head of Aegis. And Nathalie Chusseau, a professor of economics at Lille, specializing in territorial inequalities. You are an associate member of the Cercle des Economistes. And I'm Florence Besson. I'm the editor in chief of the Elle magazine. So, Nathalie, you will explain to us what a metropolis is, what is the definition of a metropolis. Police and what are the economic challenges inherent in these economic developments? Thank you, Florence. Hello to all of you. While metropolises, of course, we can raise the question, metropolises were created back in 2010, in December 2010, and it's a, a public establishment with beefed up skills or beefed up uh, remits with uh, different municipalities, and they will cooperate in order to build a development uh, economic, ecological, cultural, educational a project of their territory in order to improve the competitiveness and cohesion. So you can see that it's a matter of strengthening the role of these conurbations, the metropolises. There are the driving force for development and territory attractiveness. So why cities are considered to be wealth creation and innovation creation? So urbanization has shown that uh, is key in terms of development. If you consider the increasing uh, urbanization uh, patterns have to do with the uh, gross development product or a GDP. And you have to consider the uh, activities, their costs, uh, uh, their income connected with the economies of scale and the costs that have to do with people, mobility, goods, mobility, and mobility of information. And if you consider the uh, digital technology and all of the network transportation infrastructures play a key role when it comes to, uh, to attractiveness and location of activities, it's a matter of furthering uh, exchanges of goods, mobility of people, economies of scale, and uh, specialized activities. So uh, these infrastructures play a key role and in terms of jobs, uh, location, and production. So there's a direct link within these metropolises between the development of the amenities, economic growth, and the number of jobs that are being created in territories and regions. One of the key questions here is the way we will be developing these metropolises, the big conurbations, in order to cater for the needs in terms of regional development. And how, uh, how uh, can we uh, direct development and manage development and wealth creation? So there are different uh, players uh, to be mobilized, uh, private uh, uh, players. So you cannot uh, have economic development with uh, companies. You have the institutional uh, stakeholders, you have universities, and you have the different decision-making layers, what we call the territorial uh, maze, in fact. So you need to... Uh, 
uh, take into account the departments, the regions, the territories. So it's a matter of cooperation across these uh, different echelons. And moreover, you have the uh, uh, topic of governance. There's a cooperation that is extremely efficient. The link between metropolises and regions, and especially when metropolises launch actions as part of the regional development blueprints. In this case, the cooperation patterns work well. And what about the role of universities, the role of research, the role of academia, the link between companies and uh, campuses and universities are key when it comes to furthering innovation. That's why we have a competitive competitiveness clusters in different metropolises. Why? Because when you have a higher uh, schools and research centers next to companies, this will strengthen the uh, capabilities for innovation through uh, knowledge externalities. And these uh, companies, uh, they have uh, people who are well trained. Uh, and this will uh, bring about positive effects. And at last, but allow me to insist on a point, what will be the development avenues uh, to, to, to rely on in terms, of eco in terms of economy, in terms of territory? What projects can we build on all these uh, players, all these operators? They have to work along common objectives with well-defined projects. We talked about ecological transition. Uh, beefing up uh, the innovation uh, clusters, uh, urban renovation, accessibility, mobility, transportation, uh, and all these uh, uh, topics are essential, digital transformation. And another point, uh, i.e., uh, to reduce inequalities and mitigate them on the territory. So it means that it's necessary to invest in big projects, and they have to be drawn up at a more national level. The uh, metropolises raise a question, uh, uh, how can we make sure that the whole uh, territory benefits from wealth creation and uh, creation of value added? How is it possible to disseminate the economic uh, uh, fruit to all the uh, territory. So there are three points. Uh, mobility of people, people's mobility, this is crucial. Housing, accommodation, I hope that we'll be able to revisit uh, that topic because uh, the development and pooling of these infrastructures uh, bring about a rise in the uh, rent prices. And this uh, uh, brings about uh, some problem for students and medium-sized uh, categories who are aloof uh, then inclusion of rural population, and in this case, access uh, to digital technology uh, is uh, lower when you are in rural areas. The uh, public services VA care offers are very often uh, lumped uh, uh, into metropolises, and you have lots of territories that are vulnerable. And then poverty. And poverty is a significant uh, topic, not only in rural areas. I will uh, give you a figure, and I will conclude. Uh, on that, 77% of poor households uh, live in urban areas. So there's a real concern in terms of inequalities and imbalances within the metropolises, between the metropolises and the rest of the territories. I uh, thank you, Natalie. Uh, before uh, getting down to the nitty gritty, allow me to ask you two questions. According to you, the development of metropolises, is it inexorable? Is it a good thing? So, um, Mika Brunel. Mika Brunel, allow me to start with you. Uh, so I didn't manage the metropolis of the uh, Paris, uh, the, the greater Paris. Uh, this is Mr. Ollier. But it's uh, a trend, an underlying trend. And uh, this trend has gone unabated, I would say. Of course, uh, people want to get uh, better spaces that are more adapted. There should be a link between uh, life quality and life in metropolises. I mean, it is not antinomic. Uh, so uh, you have an urbanization a process. And what is important is to have a different uh, uses and usages. We are very happy to be here in X. Last year, we met uh, virtually, but uh, despite uh, technological breakthroughs, 
despite uh, uh, communication tools, uh, we uh, prefer uh, being here. Uh, we like uh, informal meetings because uh, this uh, gives us uh, food for thought. Uh, you were talking about uh, uh, poverty, so it's better to have our students here because uh, some of them um, are in dire straits for some of them. So we have uh, citizens commissions that will shed light on policies because they are committed. We are all inhabitants uh, of a metropolis. We are all committed. We are all engaged. And we work on different topics. And we are all committed, as I said. So we can uh, focus on uh, some uh, topics that are of interest uh, to uh, the uh, communities. And uh, we can provide some additional uh, insights. So I've noticed is that uh, population has been uh, committed uh, personally uh, and collectively. So uh, personally, uh, all together, uh, we uh, uh, focused on this uh, topic. Allow me uh, to pay tribute to um, Philippe Pelletier, who is in charge of ECODEV. And I think that he's done a better job uh, than I uh, did. So is uh, development uh, of metropolises uh, inexorable? Uh, development, does it mean growing or does it mean uh, blossoming to a certain extent? Uh, it is not inexorable if you think that uh, metropolises have to grow. So there are lots of uh, inhabitants in the metropolises. Uh, 80 or 90 percent of the people live in a cities. I mean, this movement has started 150 years ago. To years ago. So uh, maybe we are uh, the end of a road. So the uh, rail uh, industry uh, replaced in the past uh, other trips that were uh, made uh, via uh, horses. And um, of course, uh, stations are at the heart of metropolises. It's not uh, an inexorable trend. I don't believe in this concept of a French desert. I don't think uh, that uh, uh, you have uh, metropolises uh, that are stacked uh, over one another and then around there's nothing. Uh, no, that's not the case. Uh, after the COVID crisis, uh, people want to uh, get back to the countryside. They want to see cows, a kind of life that is uh, totally different. Uh, regarding uh, development and taking into account uh, the idea of uh, personal development, uh, I think that uh, metropolises they have uh, to grow and develop themselves economically with uh, sustainable progress. Uh, uh, transport is a key asset as part of the development of metropolises, but you have to consider the amenities and infrastructures uh, that you manage. And they are at the forefront of economic development. And of course, ecology is key. Uh, metropolises are really uh, involved in these uh, topics, uh, energy, eco-design, low-carbon economy. All of these uh, topics are driving forces. And um, allow me to revisit the three main uh, challenges in terms of uh, development of metropolises. So it is uh, it is both uh, inexorable and non-inexorable, I would say. Laurent Germain, what is your take on that? Uh, hi, everyone. I do think that the development of metropolis is, is an inexorable trend, and there are three main reasons uh, for that. The figures, the uh, figures are stubborn, and uh, French uh, demographics will increase uh, by 2040. There will be more than 6 million inhabitants. We are 67 uh, million inhabitants, and we will reach 73 million inhabitants. And. Uh, I think that the growth of metropolises is faster than the growth of the rest of the territory. So the demographic dimension plays a key role. Have a look at the situation in Montpellier, Rennes, Lyon, and they grew much more uh, than the other territories, faster than the uh, territories, especially when uh, population growth was a reality. And this is what the public authorities want, as Natalie pointed out. Uh, we launched a, a policy based on competitiveness clusters back uh, 
uh, in the past, I mean, 15 years ago. The objective was to make the most of the economies of scale, to make the most of the external uh, positive aspects of economy, location at the same place uh, of uh, development educational centers. And these competitiveness clusters will continue because the external uh, effects are uh, genuine and tangible. Thirdly, it will continue because France has to catch up. French metropolises don't have the critical size. If you have a look at the ranking of French metropolises versus the competitors, you have Paris in the top three. And then you uh, end up in the 38th place for the second French metropolises. And uh, you have six uh, German companies and four uh, uh, cities in the UK. What is the critical size of a metropolis? It's very difficult to come up with a figure. You have uh, some metropolises with less than one million inhabitants, and you have some metropolises with four million inhabitants for these three reasons that are substantive reason. It's an inexorable movement, but we are faced with a paradoxical situation because more population within metropolis metropolises, it means that we need to build buildings to house them, and it's uh, necessary to build amenities and facilities so that people can be mobile, but uh, cities and metropolises are responsible for 70 percent of uh, uh, GAG emissions and uh, infrastructures, uh, rail, uh, industry and buildings are responsible for 60 percent of GAG emissions. So we have to make sure that the growth of metropolises uh, is in line with the climate objectives set by governments. Of course, uh, my company is at the forefront, uh, eco-design. When you build houses, and infrastructures, it's, in, it's important to pay heed to the impact on the environment during the construction process. Of course, it's important to choose non-polluting materials, structures that are less polluting, but it's always a matter of operating these infrastructures. So we need to talk about innovation. Will Innovation will be at the forefront of the future of metro Police. With the uh, digital uh, dimension, you can model the metropolis and you can simulate, uh, model the creation of a new neighborhood, of a new infrastructure, and hence you can infer the impact on the environment. So we are in a kind of paradoxical situation if you consider the economic challenge and the uh, depollution challenge. Xavier Piechazic, the environmental challenge, you'll be talking about that. So it's a right transition. So in a city, you can, very, you can act in order to achieve carbon neutrality. So if you consider urban population, it has increased 30 times. So uh, plus 3.2 billion inhabitants in the cities, it's a European phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon, it's a French phenomenon. You have to consider demographics. And as Nathalie said, uh, innovation, uh, know-how, uh, education is uh, are being concentrated on specific locations. And in, in France, we know that uh, industry has been on the wane, and we uh, focused on uh, services-driven uh, jobs. And most of the time, there are in cities. The share of the industry in GDP is 10 percent. And it will be very difficult to uh, get above that figure. We'll try to uh, overshoot uh, that uh, figure, but it will be uh, difficult. So that's a fact. But we have a challenge to take up the uh, climate uh, challenge. We've heard about zero net carbon emission in 2050. And when we look at the different activities, human activities, they are concentrated in metropolises, uh, but on, on a non institutional institutional basis. But regarding uh, climate change, we need to find an answer in metropolises. Uh, this is uh, quite uh, uh, interesting, but we'll have uh, to forge solutions where there are lots of people, where there's a high concentration of economic activities. And to make a, a long story uh, short, uh, 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 French people have perceived that need. Not only scientists, BVA conducted a poll. Uh, France and the city of uh, tomorrow. It's an online survey. People who live in uh, cities, I mean, they uh, think about the challenges uh, in a city. They say that uh, sustainable development is the uh, uh, chief challenge for the future. It's a spontaneous comment. Uh, most of them think that uh, think that they live in an environment that is of poor quality in France, but it's even worse uh, in cities. So they also reckon that 
for the main part, what is important in cities is to preserve natural areas. Uh, uh, the top priority being given to water and climate. And they are talking about urban sprawl. So it's not a scientific fact only. It's a social awareness raising process. So it means that cities will have to cater for the needs and requirements inherent in sustainability and zero carbon, zero carbon uh, uh, footprint. And I can tell you this is the daunting challenge. Uh, the, and the most imperious, uh, imperious uh, challenge. Laurent Germain, you've talked about uh, climate. It's a ma major challenge, but there are other challenges. When you talk about uh, urban conurbation, urban sprawl, it's a so social challenge, uh, isn't it? I think that we need to revisit uh, the way the uh, buildings are being built in metropolises, and we need to remove the taboo of height because of the past uh, decades, uh, uh, the situation has been characterized by urban sprawl. So today, it is less expensive and it is less negative uh, uh, to focus on high-rise buildings. So you can have high-rise high buildings. There can be office spaces, but there can be also a personal accommodation. And it's a matter of wealth creation. So in Paris, for example, there's a debate about uh, high-rise buildings. And uh, public debate has been polarized on that. But uh, I think that we need to reconcile those uh, two objectives. Uh, Marlene uh, oh, Meka. Uh, uh, Brenel. So it's a key uh, challenge for you at Jessina. Yes, it's true. It's a major challenge. You've talked about the revolution of the uh, railway. It's a, a significant revolution, but uh, since the 1960s, I mean, we've been witnessing the revolution of the automotive industry. And you have the silo based approach. Uh, I uh, live in a place, I live in a place, I go to work at another place, and uh, I go to the cinema um, at another place again. So it's uh, a matter of reconciling all these uh, three uh, issues. So density versus urban sprawl, I mean, this is intertwined. So when you talk about uh, these uh, subjects, you would think that uh, these are uh, topics are not uh, intermingled, but uh, we want to make sure that people live together, share together uh, for uh, everyone. So urban sprawl, I haven't used that expression for quite a long time, but urban sprawl, it is the dream of desperate housewives that is over the suburban home, the dog, and the, the, the husband who commutes for two hours. And so much the better, because why is it useful? Uh, and what about uh, what I would call the emergency of life? At Jessina, uh, at the start of the year, we have uh, 20 billion euros worth of assets, 80% in offices, 20% uh, in uh, residential uh, accommodation, and we've uh, forged uh, partnerships with Next City and Goodyear in order to uh, build 5,000 uh, um, uh, homes or, or flats. There is no uh, uh, supply. It's the principle of supply of demand. So. Uh, there is no uh, supply, but the societal needs have increased. Uh, people get married when then they divorce. So there are different stages in life. So we need to come up with the adapted and tailor-made uh, offer that will meet the uh, comfort needs and requirements. So urban sprawl is a source of pollution, carbon emission, but it's also a source of discomfort. And you have lots of societal topics uh, that are at stake. As part of our as part of our portfolio, so 10% uh, of office renovation and 90% of uh, construction, zero net carbon plan. We have a CSR uh, a director who decided to use the 
uh, net zero, net carbon. We need to work on the current portfolio of projects. When we launch some work, I mean, we decided to focus on carbon, but you have carbon because carbon you can uh, measure carbon very easily it's much more difficult to gauge uh, GHG emissions and with carbon we don't take into account biodiversity and we should do that because this would contribute to a carbon absorption so we uh, adopted a biased approach so that we can engage our customers and clients our employees and we can nurture a kind of dialogue all together we need to work in order to to change uses and usages. It's a transformative process. And uh, it means that uh, Jessina has innovated. My colleague of the executive committee who is in charge of finance came up with the idea uh, to green 100% of our portfolio of projects. Uh, uh, the uh, emissions to green the emissions in order to focus on building performance in a dynamic way. Once uh, we've reached the different uh, stages and once we've achieved the uh, trajectory of decarbonization, we could uh, build uh, new buildings uh, that are cleaner and um, uh, uh, the uh, emission companies, uh, the bondholders uh, agreed uh, to those projects that we launched. So it's time consuming, but we have no choice but to do that. So the tempo has been set. I mean, we cannot look backwards. You're right. Uh, this is a, a request that is made by people, by our employees. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, when I built uh, buildings uh, uh, performing uh, buildings, I was told, they are expensive. There would be two categories of buildings, virtuous, expensive buildings, and uh, the uh, buildings that are uh, cheap and uh, that are not energy efficient. That's not possible. That's not feasible. And now, when you build a building, it's important, I mean, to talk with uh, uh, customers. And uh, you can't say that uh, part of a portfolio of uh, buildings um, is made up of uh, uh, buildings that are not efficient. When we talk about uh, housing accommodations, we need to take into account this uh, virtuous uh, circle. So we'll be revisiting all these uh, points. Of course, uh, it's, uh, it's true that all of these uh, topics are intertwined. We are talking about climate and the environmental challenges that are pivotal. And then we will be focusing on the social and territorial challenges and the economic, social, and economic uh, uh, objectives and policies that have to be implemented. So we looked at the uh, different uh, significant uh, issues with uh, SNCF uh, uh, stations and connections, Marlene, what is really important for the uh, stations? These are small metropolises with 10 million visitors a day in our stations. There are three main uh, challenges when it comes to the development of metropolises. Ecology, everybody has talked about that. But regarding ecology, I would say that metropolises uh, have uh, to uh, curtail uh, energy consumptions. So uh, self-energy, uh, self-consumptions uh, regarding energy, we will uh, be installing uh, photovoltaic panels in the stations regarding waste. We need to deploy some efforts and uh, we uh, commit uh, uh, to uh, uh, zero waste uh, and waste has to be recycled as well. We have an architecture uh, sector line with some methods that we are implementing. Uh, we have a different acronym, EMC2B. But it's a matter of focusing on eco-design. It's important to get um, some biosourced uh, material, um, reuse some materials. So. All this has to do with the ecology, and I can tell you that uh, stations can have an impact. Then you have uh, intermodality. It's uh, fundamental. Metropolises are hubs. We are in Aix-Marseille. It's a hub between the sea, air, and rail. So we are at the heart of the hubs. In stations, regarding intermodalities, we can enable people to move from one city to another, from one station to another with the Metropolitan Express uh, uh, stations that will be able to reach out to uh, suburbs 
for example, when you think about a station, the first image that comes to mind is congestion, but we want to foster uh, intermobility with some uh, parking uh, sites, I mean, for bicycles, and we want to uh, develop uh, tramway lines and metro lines. At Aix-en-Provence, there are huge uh, parking lots so that you can park your car there. And the third challenge of the metropolis is to be a place of life. Uh, and when you go to a railway station, you can see an embodiment of French society. You've talked about social inequalities in stations. We can see that there are some social inequalities, imbalances. In during the COVID-19, uh, stations were the place to be. I mean, there were lots of different people, different professional categories, different categories as a whole in stations. So metropolises uh, um, uh, made it uh, possible to further uh, culture. So uh, without uh, stations, uh, women and other people uh, couldn't uh, get access to culture. So metropolises are a place of em emancipation and uh, uh, stations are a good representation of that. We uh, stage 150 exhibitions in stations a year, so we want to bring a culture uh, closer to uh, people. So, Laurent, you wanted to add something. We've talked about buildings, but we need to focus on mobility. Uh, we want to be consistent with the objective i.e. to reduce um, GAG emissions, but at the end of the day, who pays? And do we implement uh, regulations? Do we implement rules? In France, uh, there are lots of rules. There's a burden of rules, and I think uh, that there will be a new rules uh, uh, that will be introduced. Uh, so low emission rules on regulations, but uh, they have uh, to be efficient. So we'll have uh, to inject innovation in order to uh, uh, respect uh, these uh, uh, areas. And people who do not respect uh, the rules, I mean, should uh, be sanctioned. So innovation is at the heart of innovation in cities. We'll have to reduce the number of cars in cities. If we take the example of Paris, at a given point in time, 40% of the vehicles in the metropolis uh, are trying to get and find a parking lot, uh, a parking spot. So we need to uh, sort out this problem. Technology can provide us with a solution uh, through the uh, possibility of reading um, registration plates and uh, people could be fined with a back office uh, solution. So regarding uh, uh, the climate, Xavier Pechagé, uh, can you talk about the different uh, measures that need to be adopted? Uh, so uh, to use uh, electricity in many industries, for example. So I will give you some figures. And 2050, 2050 in 30 years' time, we are under the impression that it's uh, far away. But uh, if you consider metropolises, uh, this time frame is short. I mean, uh, cities are being transformed uh, very slowly. So 30 years for a city, it's nothing. So 2050. So. Do you know the low carbon strategy of France, whereby France uh, uh, should reach zero net emission in 2050? We will curtail our emissions, as Laurent said, so there shouldn't be any emission in 2050. So we'll have uh, to curtail the emissions very significantly. Of course, in some sectors, uh, uh, agriculture, farming, um, the, 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 these sectors can't be fully carbon free. But in 30 years' time, our metropolises I mean, should reach zero emissions. So it's a significant uh, decline. Uh, what does it mean, this French strategy, between now, 2020 and 2050? It means that we should have reached 40 percent in terms of energy efficiency. So we will have to consume less energy to the tune of 40 percent. That's quite a lot, because at the same time, the population is growing, and we are uh, and, and industry are gaining ground and zero carbon emission. So it means that we shouldn't uh, uh, consume oil and fossil fuel in our metropolises. So we need 
to transform our usages in order to mitigate the use of oil and the use of fossil gas. A third effort, uh, electrification. We will need energy in cities in the future, and this energy will be uh, power driven, will be electricity driven, uh, carbon free electricity in France, and that's already the case in France, uh, carbon free electricity. So it means that we'll have to use electricity for different usages. So these are technical and technological challenges. So we need to focus on these challenges. So we have the residential issue, services, industry. You have mobility issues to take into account. What kind of energy do we use when we move around? So this has to do with the usage of the cities. In the future, the cities will be a denser. Uh, this is uh, the whole framework. <coughs> Maybe uh, there are some trajectories to embark upon. Uh, will we be able to do that at a toward price? Thank you. No, it's very good to have a little bit of suspense. So uh, I think, Marlene, you have a scoop for us on these energy stations you wanted to talk about. Yes, this uh, objective of zero net emissions is very ambitious for everybody. Trains are a decarbonated means of transport, and we encourage this, of course. And in the future, we, we, we talk, we're, for the future, we're talking a lot about hydrogen. What we're thinking about uh, for city centers with uh, uh, big car parks is to create the petrol stations of the future, the energy stations of the future with, with renewable energies that can also feed, uh, supply the trains. For the SNCF, you also talk about green uh, uh, transport, yes, with car parks and bikes, yes, or green stations. So the idea is that the stations, become, uh, we become the specialists of green stations and among the challenges around energies and waste and eco-design. Uh, but we have a long way to go uh, for energy. We still uh, have uh, uh, f fuel in certain stations. And uh, uh, there are questions like, why um, are the stations lit up at certain hours of the night? So if we want to um, distinguish certain things, it, it might be uh, th there's a question of a dark station at night and a question of security when people and women, uh, men and women might not want to go through the station at night because it's too dark. So there are, all of this has to be taken into account. When you talk about uh, bicycles, we have to rem recall that not everybody can ride a bicycle. If you're a pregnant woman, you have a family, you're disabled, an older person, you're talking about the last kilometer and the fact of, that rather than using a a Amazon to not mention them, we can uh, stations could also be warehouses where we go and get our packages. Yes, we're thinking uh, to, at the moment with the logistics specialists of the final kilometer, uh, as to how we can use the space we have in the station. So we're, uh, the first uh, tests are undergoing in French uh, cities, uh, cities, so that they're, uh, they are parcel warehouses, and uh, the, the, so the process is entirely green, that the, hu the hub uh, where the uh, parcels, uh, uh, the hub for the parcels is um, stations, and that soft mo mobility is used for the final kilometer. So I'd like to ask a question. When we say in the cities, if we travel by underground, we won't pollute as much as in, whereas in the country, we uh, have to use our uh, car. But in fact, there's something we called a barbecue effect, which I discovered, which is an American theory. So when you're in a city, as you don't have a garden, you want to leave the city. And so uh, city dwellers leave, uh, take the plane far more than people living in the country. And if you live in the country, you'll stay at home and have a barbecue. So, of course, uh, I think in Nantes you have built a peaceful city, so there have to be green spaces to, for a breath of fresh air. And lots of studies have shown it. When you see a tree, you're less violent and you heal better uh, in a hospital if you can see a tree rather than a wall. 
Yes, indeed. There are studies that demonstrate that there is a probability that uh, decreases by 30% regarding stress if we live close to the countryside. So the challenge of uh, future metropolises is to bring plants back into the city. So, obviously, this is the concern of a lot of uh, metropolises and their uh, governors, elected uh, government. But uh, there are tremendous studies that are uh, carried out in different parts of the world. And my group today is developing a project that consists in taking Riyadh, which is the capital of the Arab Saudi Arabia in the center of the desert, which has a 1% plant coverage, to take it up to 9%. Why? Because due to the demography of uh, Saudi Arabia, the population will be going from 7 to 15 million, not in 40 years, but in 10 years' time. So the sustainable nature of, the, of life within the city is now a question, and we need to plant 10 million trees within this metropolis, metropolis. So yes, it's a tremendous challenge, and I think that uh, public policies must allow us to bring uh, uh, nature back into the cities. <clears throat> in Riyadh, therefore, is it really ecological to do this, given that th this would require a great deal of water? It's a bit ambivalent, isn't it? Yes, when we take a public policy decision, there are always external negative effects. Uh, when we created uh, the, the project of Riyadh, we considered that uh, the contribution in terms of depollution was uh, higher to the cost of the irrigation system necessary to, uh, to keep these plants alive. So regarding uh, urban sprawl and uh, green areas, yes, a number of things for me. I don't know if the barbecue effect is uh, really at fault in terms of uh, climate, global warming. No, for sure it's not. But in Riyadh, you can cook your steaks on the pavement and uh, they will cook directly so we don't even need any other source of heat. We can use solar energy. No, more seriously, I think that uh, the ur urgency is such, and in terms of construction, we must really ra uh, raise this question. We can't always look at other people doing it. Let's set the example. Let's uh, be pioneers and uh, uh, try to develop new techniques, which we don't have yet. And let us apply, uh, apply the rule of 80-20. If we really concentrate our efforts where they need to be, in metropolises, in the cities, by taking into account all of this, because uh, green contributes to reducing the carbon impact, we will manage to solve a large part, 80% of the problems. We will solve the 20 remaining percent later, because often in these subjects, we spend more time on the details. If we want to solve the 10th uh, uh, figure after the uh, dot, uh, uh, it's a lost cause. So one of the questions is, how can we uh, have um, uh, buildings that are agnostic to the type of energy. I agree with you that in the end it will be electricity, but we must be able to transform these. Because two years ago in France, uh, everyone said, no, nuclear power is terrible. Uh, we, then the COVID struck, nuclear power is good. How can investors take decisions that are uh, long decisions that take time to change the type of energy? So let us find the means uh, uh, to make uh, energy or agnostic be it for buildings, uh, planes, uh, trains to so the type of energy. We're working on a research program in this respect. The buildings must be uh, intrinsically highly uh, successful and independently of this we must solve the other problems. But everybody in the countryside who's becoming a farmer with a uh, uh, thanks to tutorials on the web, I don't believe in. And I think that it's dangerous uh, for the health of consumers in the future. Yes. Uh, what, what, what are you frightened of in terms of this type of farming? No, it's because farming is a, a profession. Uh, being uh, the manager of uh, 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 housing is a profession, but uh, farming is a very, very difficult uh, job which requires a lot of knowledge and experience. I also wanted to talk about the notion of remote working. Uh, because we haven't talked about it. Of course, technology allowed us to work uh, fr from home or at a distance and relatively uh, effectively if we were well equipped. 
But remote work as a religion, in particular from home, is something which is very bad for health. We say that screens are bad for young people. I'm not sure that it's any better for older people, such as myself. And in addition to this, it means that people are isolated. And we must be aware of something. The consequences of everything we're saying is uh, digitalizations that will um, massively eliminate jobs, administrative jobs, and intermediate management jobs to the benefit of service uh, jobs or high added value jobs. We have to place our money, energy, and our collective power into training um, uh, professional reconversion and working at home is even worse for women. They have obtained, achieved emancipation. You t it isolates them. I don't know why, as women, we believe that we are superheroes. My son-in-law said we can't, uh, we're, we're not multitask like uh, men, so we have to get rid of that idea. We must consider that we must have an equality of rights and to live our life as we expect it, but to have the right to go out. If we work in a third uh, place outside, OK, but not from home. And as a company manager, we, we enter into people's personal lives. I don't want my employer to come into my home beyond a certain level. And I don't want to go into other people's houses. I've done a lot of Zooms in Anglo-Saxon countries in the bedrooms of certain people. The bed was unmade. I must say that it's not pleasant at all. So let us put a few barriers there. It would be uh, good to have few, some barriers uh, with regard to our private life. No, you're right. Uh, with the COVID, we must repeat, you're right. Uh, women, uh, 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 emancipation have digressed by 10 years. Yes, on re remote working, I uh, agree on this opinion on the women, but I think there's also a real topic for young people who are entering the job market. And people, uh, young people entering the job market today have never had a... Um, an immediate supervisor to explain uh, the economic uh, uh, process of a company. Sometimes it's easier to just take a piece of paper and draw a, 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 a picture. Uh, and so they're very isolated. They don't learn from the experience of their supervisors. And they don't have this uh, corporate sensor, which is that of the coffee machine. Remote working for one or two days, OK, why not? But beyond that. I entirely share the point of view that has just uh, been mentioned. Yes, I would just like to add a point because young people and their learning uh, of uh, in the workplace is very important. I just want to say a couple of words about students and uh, distance learning, where things were very complicated, very complicated for them. Uh, as what you're saying, Mika, is also true for students in their bedrooms alone. There was a lot of isolation, and as a teacher. It's far easier to explain things when you're with people in the room and to see the reactions uh, on people's faces than uh, even though we have developed our ability to, uh, for e-learning uh, or distance learning, we have left a lot of students on, uh, uh, behind us on the way. And so, uh, without, so there's the question of the teachers without uh, talking of the uh, living conditions of students, which have really deteriorated. Yes, with a, with a high increase in percentage of uh, suicide among young people. Yes, and health problems also. So speaking as, uh, about students has uh, led to this other challenge. And uh, Mika Brunan, I'm telling to you, developing metropol metropolises so that they're not uh, siloed off socially. And so that a, somebody that looks after the cash register lives a long way off from where they work. How can we develop uh, cities and avoid uh, this siloing off? So we're talking about metropolization, but what is um, uh, important above all is to have mixed-use neighborhoods around transport hubs and mixed uh, uh, mixity for all uses. Social integration happens through meetings, the fact that children go to the same school, that there are birthday parties at the same time, etc. together. We have so much need for housing. Of course, we need decent housing, but we just need basic housing. Uh, we must come back to the city. We must create this uh, social mixity. We must uh, 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 encourage rental, intermediate or private uh, uh, rental housing uh, for intermediate uh, classes. Not everybody can have uh, social housing. And we must avoid the creation of ghettos. 
we are the last of the Mohicans were, were institutions that have remained in the field of housing and we've saved the last uh, uh, buildings so that they're not sold off and for more than 30 years the different policies that were implemented said uh, that uh, the uh, renters and uh, um, uh, the good guys and the institutional uh, rent rentors are the bad guys. I must say that uh, managing rental accommodation is also a profession. I don't know if you've ever signed a lease, be it a, uh, for the owner or the rent, the renter or the rentee. Uh, the, you need to know exactly what to to put in it. We know how to manage different uh, rent levels. Uh, everybody in the same building pays a different rent. It's not the same. Uh, it's not the same apartment. Not the same entry date. I think we have to uh, leave a possibility to companies such as ours to manage this. Of course, this needs an uh, official approval uh, to manage intermediate housing. We did this in the field of uh, Abre with a lot greater discussion with the uh, state. Uh, we have a building permit to. Uh, build 540 uh, uh, accommodations, so 460 are uh, 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 social housing. Uh, I fought so that we could uh, include the social housing. So uh, far more than 44 how, uh, accommodations out of 800. But uh, so that we could maintain the ownership and the decision power, so that we were not creating co-ownership associations that of a great uh, uh, interest and a formed of neighbours. But uh, there are not common means between different uh, individual owners to imp do work and uh, create services. But we can do this uh, in addition as a complement to private ownership, as a complement to social uh, to social housing, but in a more massive. Uh, with a more uh, manner, and out of the 700 accommodations that we uh, own, we are doing their energy reconversion and uh, insulation. It is a combat. It's a race against time, but we have to have the means to do this. The demand is there. We have to be able to do it. We have to extend this type of approach. And due to uh, digitalization, uh, there will be far less uh, need of uh, office space. The Paris area, uh, uh, the 55 or 56 a million, according to the demonstrations, London and Greater London is uh, 38 million square meters. So we won't need as much. What will we need? We must transform this office space into accommodations with the uh, possibility of doing this massively. And on the roofs, we can put uh, uh, photovoltaic farms and plant, create roofs. Thank you very much. So before coming to you, uh, Xavier Pesimic, the stations are also the place where socially everybody meets. They have a very important role to play in uh, bringing peace to making uh, peaceful cities. Yes, stations are a place where everybody can, that everybody goes to. Sometimes you even walk through a station to get from one area to another. Nevertheless, stations must uh, make people want to take the train. So they must be um, trustworthy places where people want to go. So there's a real question of security within the stations. And we need to make sure that everybody uh, wants to go to the station um, to take the train. So this brings us to this social question. It is also a question of the relationship with the territory. You were saying that we could create photovoltaic farms, but actually, uh, Xavier Pichasik, you said to cities are not islands. We can't have all of our energy in the cities. Do you want to come back to this question of the relationship with uh, the outskirts, uh, the territories, as we call them? Although this name is it's not very nice, uh, the, the countryside, let's say, countryside. Yeah, before that, I would like to react to what Mika said because she really put her finger on the question of uh, thermal renovation. We knew, talked a lot about sustainability of the city and the questions of climate. Uh, amidst all of this, there is a uh, renovation of buildings. I trust in the fact that our engineers, architects and urban developers, our land managers find solutions so that uh, new buildings, so that the new part of the city is uh, effective in 30 years. No problem with that. The problem is what existing buildings. And last night, we all walked through uh, the streets of Aix-en-Provence. We're looking up and we're wondering how these buildings 
from the 18th, 19th and beginning of the 20th century can be energy efficient in 30 years' time because they must be energy efficient also. So this means a great deal of investment. The ecologic transition costs can cost a lot if you don't go about it in the right way. All of this ends up in the hands of operators such as ourselves, but also the local authorities, metropolitan authorities. And I think that we must, uh, these uh, territory, local authorities must already make choices in their public policies and also choices within their very public policies in terms of habitation, in habit uh, accommodation, and also the choices regarding thermal renovation. We won't be able to have the time to talk about uh, defiscalization for uh, carbon defiscalization, but we have to talk about it. When we say that uh, the, the battle against the climate is a race against time, we have to start with the most effective public policies. And with regard to that, not all uh, thermal isolation insulation is uh, effective in the same way. We have to we have to uh, begin with thermal insulation because that's where we can gain a lot in in, in CO2. Before saying that metropolises cannot be islands. We must understand that all of this is very difficult and we don't have a lot of time. And we must talk about planning. And this planning is the planning of the space. It is also the planning of economic tools and also the planning of infrastructures. We will not achieve our objectives if we place in the hands of pub, uh, public authorities a strong, uh, unless we give them strong planning possibilities, including the economic incentives that we need. The uh, yellow vest episode and uh, uh, the we, and uh, econ economic incentives uh, for uh, the carbon trajectory. This has not been explained properly. Just two comments. There is the question of territorial inequalities if the metropolises continue to expand and be economically dynamic, because 30 minutes from the metropolises, the cities are losing inhabitants. So there's a major challenge, which is that of connectivity between metropolises and their outskirts. And we need to know who will fund this, which leads me to a reflection on how the elections are organized, and in particular local elections in our country. The fact that there is not a, a, an identical uh, calendar complicates public decisions and uh, means that there is a declining participation. I think it would be healthy for uh, local authorities to align their mandates, mandates and that we vote at the same time for all of the different local authorities in, uh, so that we can align the calendars, because the decisions made are decisions that require visibility and planning, as Xavier said. And I think that the multiplication of the local elections according to different calendars is not something that goes in a favorable direction to aligning the different public policies. And we can't talk, talk about multiplication, but you said also there are too many communes in France. Yes, we must uh, raise the question, bravely raise the question of the decrease in the number of our communes from 36,000 in France. Uh, that is uh, adds uh, to complexity. Of course, it's an advantage in terms of proximity, but a tremendous uh, problem of complexity of political decisions with constant compromises within the intercommunal uh, authorities. So I'm very favorable to reducing, drastically reducing the number of communes in France. This is one of the reasons why uh, France is the country which has the greatest uh, soil artificialization in the world. We have the largest number of uh, uh, roundabouts and supermarkets. Three comments to what was said. The first is that I do think indeed that we must uh, create priorities. We can't do everything at once. The question is, uh, uh, there, uh, there's a question of priorities. There are some things that we are better at than others. So we have to decide in terms of thermal renovation. Uh, where we need to uh, concentrate our efforts. That should be decided within the metropolises in partnership with the different stakeholders. That's essential. I think that this should be done within the framework of a qualification, a clear qualification, and at what scale? Because giving uh, the power of planification to the metropolis or the region, why not? But we will no doubt uh, need something even more directive within the framework of major uh, uh, challenges that are decided at state level. Here we're talking about the energy transition. We know that it's a uh, priority for the revival plan. 
so uh, with the recovery plan so uh, giving uh, decision uh, making power to lower levels is very good but apart from the in question of electoral calendars and the different levels of uh, the territorial a multi-layered uh, political organization in France, that there, there is a time for uh, politics and a time for planning and implementation of public policies. And indeed here, this is a very long-term process, even though 2050 is not very far off for a metropolis, is, it is an immediate future. But I would say that in 2050, we don't know who will be the elected representatives and who will take the decisions. So it is a real question uh, regarding the, the time aspect of these investments, because we are talking about very costly investments, but which are, of course, effective in the long term. And to debate also on how to uh, uh, make sure that the territories don't have two speed uh, development so that the outskirts are, are poorer and the metropolises thrive. So I'm just, uh, I would like to let you speak freely about this. I think there's a lot of debate. Yeah, so yes, uh, me metropolises need the, the surrounding uh, uh, territories for access to nature, for farming, for production of energy and electricity for the future because we won't be putting wind turbines on the central square of uh, Aix-en-Provence. Uh, solar panels on the roof will not be sufficient. So if there are a certain number of utilities uh, what that far, that are uh, in the countryside, I think that we must think about the contract between the metropolises and its uh, environment. And who says contract says exchange? And why not exchange of incomes? Because we have to come back on this. We must speak of exchange of revenues with the environment of the metropolis itself and without uh, whilst of avoiding desertification you say maybe uh, to the contrary there has to be more mobilities and in surrounding area uh, territories that there be fewer people also yes i think that we must uh, accept that in france the level of mobility is highly insufficient there is no mobility from uh, less economic dynamic zones to the more economic economically dynamic zones. So there's a political choice to be made. I think that we have to assume the fact that uh, we must have clear political choices and these have not yet been made because we want to carry on supporting all of the territories and I think that this political choice must be made. And directly to the country in the SNCF you've created a program called 1001 Stations Yes, the French railway station is rooted within the territory. We guarantee mobility between different areas and above all. There's a lot of debate at the moment and uh, all of the subjects are extremely complex. But uh, yes, we, we are really rooted in uh, throughout France in the, all the territories. Uh, yes, Mecca Bruno, yes, I wanted to say uh, that we must be more positive as compared to 20 years ago where there was Paris and the rest of the world. There are metropolises that have arisen. Uh, in particular, thanks to trains and high-speed connections. Now we need to um, get out of this uh, digital desert as well. There's other infrastructures that we're developing. So we're starting to have real metropolises. So let, let, let us conclude on a more positive note. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Go ahead. Microphone, please. Yes, I'm an uh, economist, but I'm also local. I have a question. I have to create a new neighborhood in uh, the Paris area. And what we're lacking is to have a toolbox to do everything that we talked about. I'm an energy economist. There is no toolbox. Box. And for a commune of 8,000 inhabitants such as mine, it's very difficult to create a new neighborhood with 2,500 accommodations. It's very complicated. Is there a solution to this? Because it's a major topic with regard to all of the challenges that you've mentioned. <clears throat> Would anyone like to answer? Just to say that you're right, and it is necessary to have toolboxes uh, for this. Yes, we can create a common toolbox. Yeah, that will be the object of a seminar between the different partners. Yes, because there are lots of uh, infrastructure networks here. Yes, thank you. We will leave the... Thank you very much.